Hi everyone, I'm Rincy and this is Rincy Reads. I am back to do another weekly reading update. This is going to be a long one. I've read five books so far <laughs> since last week. I took this whole week off because I knew it was going to be a difficult week and I also worked as like a polling place worker on Tuesday and so I was just like I'm going to take the whole week off. Um, I'm going to take Twitter and Instagram off of my phone and I'm going I, it worked out very well that like this week is beautiful here in Chicago like upper 60s low 70s all week long pretty sunny outside uh, so I've been <laughs> taking a book going to the lakefront reading outside for hours upon hours not paying attention to the news and uh, I recommend it. I've also been buying a lot of books. I've visited two bookstores um, over the course of this week so far as like an early birthday present to myself and also to partially uh, stock up I guess <laughs> before what I assume will be an eventual re-lockdown the way things are going. So yeah, I uh, have been buying a lot of books, but I've also been reading a lot of books. So this is not typical for me, but you know, it's my vacation basically, and I am going to spend as much of it outside as I possibly can. I'm going to spend as much of it reading as I possibly can. So let's talk about the five books I've read since last Friday. So first up, I have American Sherlock by Kate Winkler Dawson. The subtitle to this book is Murder, Forensic, and the Birth of American C.S. I. So this is a book I picked up to talk about on Red or Dead, which is the murder thriller podcast that I co-host for Book Riot. There is always a link for that down in the description in case you haven't heard me talk about that before for some reason, if you're new here and you are interested in checking it out. But basically for this week's episode that comes out today, we did a whole nonfiction November thing. And so Katie and I each picked up a nonfiction book and this is the one that I picked. This book is basically like a mini biography of Edward Oscar Heinrich, who was basically dubbed like the American Sherlock Holmes. He was a forensic scientist and one of the very first forensic scientists out there. And he basically developed a lot of the groundbreaking and also what is now considered very basic techniques that is used in investigations, specifically things like using fingerprints and using fingerprints as evidence in court cases, polygraph testing, blood splatter like patterns and using that, figuring out those patterns and using that as evidence to prove someone's guilt or innocence, things along those lines. Things that again, like to a 2020 person seems like very basic ideas, but back in like, you know, the 19, 20s it wasn't developed yet and so this guy is basically considered like one of the four founders of what is now considered forensic science this book covers some of the things that he developed and how he basically created these systems so the way the book is structured is you follow a couple of different cases that he testified on and it talks about like some of the specific techniques that he used in order to provide evidence in those cases. She also talks about kind of like the biases that were working against him and how like some of the techniques that he used were questioned a lot by like prosecution or defendants. So yeah, overall I like this book. Some of the cases were definitely more interesting than others and some of the techniques are definitely more interesting than others. This is not like a full biography so you don't find out like a full detailed background on this guy but you do get a little bit of history and you find out a little bit about like his childhood which led him to eventually becoming a forensic scientist and a little bit about the struggles that he went through he wasn't super comfortable with the amount of tension that he was getting but I really enjoyed this a lot I think it was a really good read I also really appreciated the fact that the author takes the time to talk about the fact that not all of the techniques that were developed and continue to be used are great. Um, she talks about the flaws in the system and how there were flaws from the beginning and those flaws continue into the current judicial and criminal justice system and that is always a thing that I appreciate in books like this. So yeah I think that if you are someone who is interested at all in like kind of like true crime forensic science stuff this is worth picking up it's pretty short um so it's not like super super detailed or comprehensive but it's a nice little overview into this man and some of the techniques that he created so yeah solid like three three and a half star book for me and again that one is called american sherlock all right next up i read memorial by brian washington this is one of those like literary fiction books coming out this year or coming out this fall that has been getting a decent amount of buzz so i put a hold on it in my library and got it 
relatively quickly in my opinion. So in the story, you are following these two men named Benson and Mike who live in Houston and live together. They are dating. Mike is of Japanese descent and the story begins with Mike finding out that his estranged father is dying of cancer in Japan and so he decides that he is going to go to Japan to see his father before he dies. At the same time though his mother who also lives in Japan is flying into Houston to see Mike but Mike is still going to leave to go to Japan and Mike's mother is going to stay in his apartment with his boyfriend Benson. Benson is this black man and he has kind of like a tenuous relationship with his family for reasons that you find out about in over the course of this story and he has like a very you know awkward situation that he's in where one this relationship that he's in with Mike it basically seems to be continuing purely based on inertia and now his mother is like moving into the apartment for who knows how long while Mike is in Japan for who knows how long. So the story starts off from Benson's perspective and it starts like pretty soon as the mother arrives and Mike is leaving um, but over the course of the story you see like flashbacks in time of how these two met and what their relationship has been like but eventually it switches over to Mike's perspective and you see a little bit of what happens while he's in Japan and what prompts him to make certain choices and eventually what happens when he comes back to the United States and I won't say anything more than that. This book was a interesting experience like the writing in here is great. I think the problem that I had is twofold. One, the story starts off entirely from Brenton's perspective so you read like a solid 100 pages or so and then it switches to Mike's perspective and at that point I was really mad that it switches to Mike's perspective because I love Benson as a character and I loved what was happening with Benson and kind of like the character development I suppose that he's going through. Like it was all so so fascinating. So to switch perspective it does the thing that I hate <laughs> and so I was like mad at the book for that. Um, but you know all this stuff that happens with Mike didn't feel understandable to me. This feels like a very New York novel besides the fact that it takes place in Houston. Like it's these two guys who are in a relationship with each other for reasons that make no sense whatsoever. There's no like understanding here of like what is going on in this relationship and maybe this is like a very like young millennial thing and I specifically say young millennial because I'm 34 so I'm technically a millennial but like I don't understand relationships like this like they barely talk to each other they barely share anything about their lives with each other yet they still like move in together and they like keep going basically because of inertia and it seems like they're just kind of in this relationship because they have no reason not to be in this relationship. The borders of this relationship are completely malleable because like it kind of seems like they're in an open relationship but they don't explicitly say anything either way and it's not completely clear how either of them feels about the other. But then at the end like certain things that happen slash don't happen and it doesn't make sense to me at all. So like the relationship in here is completely frustrating to me because I don't understand it at all. Like to me Benson as a character 100% made sense and again I think because you're seeing everything maybe from Benson's perspective first maybe that's why I feel that way but when it switches over to Mike's perspective I don't understand any of Mike's choices or what he's doing or why he's doing it and so everything in that section just like really really frustrated me and then it switches back to Benson's perspective and everything just felt so unsatisfactory the way that it ended but at the same time I'm just like maybe that's just what life is like and so I can't fault this for being honest or for not giving me a ending that's satisfactory because life has unsatisfactory endings and so I have like very complicated feelings about this book like if this book had been told entirely from Benson's perspective and the ending had been a little bit different which again I'm not going to go into because spoilers I probably would have given this like a solid four four and a half star maybe even five star rating but that moment that it switches to Mike's perspective like everything just fell apart for me but that just might be me very conflicted feelings about this book I think I'm just gonna give it a three three and a half star rating because again I was very compelled by the story 
but it just doesn't completely make sense to me. But again, maybe that's just me having a very narrow view of like life and relationships and things you should be doing in a relationship, but I don't know. All right, next up, I have, <laughs> on a completely different note, Scandinavian Noir in Pursuit of a Mystery by Wendy Lesser. This is another book that I had conflicted feelings on. Um, I picked this up because it's a nonfiction book. I had this on my nonfiction November TBR. The way this book is broken up is into two sections. The first section is Wendy Lesser talking about Scandinavian Noir as is hinted at as the title and she specifically focuses on I think it's Denmark, Sweden, and Norway that just because those are like specifically the books that she has experience with and so she talks about like the history of those mystery books or mystery books set in those places and kind of like the boom of those types of mystery books and she talks about the different themes that she sees in those books and the ideas that she's formulated about those countries based on those books. That's like the entire first section. So the first section goes through a bunch of different mystery series and she talks, she gives you a spoiler warning at the beginning, which I appreciated. But yeah, she goes into like detail about like a bunch of different characters in a bunch of different mystery novels um, from these countries and kind of the characterizations that they pick up and how that's reflective of these different countries in different ways or those are the things that she assumes. And then the second part of the book is about her spending significant amounts of time in all of those countries. So she spends like a, I think a couple of months traveling around all of those different countries trying to see one different places that are referenced in all of those books but two also trying to understand like the culture and the world that actually exists in these countries uh, and how they do and don't reflect what she has assumed based on the books that she reads. So anyone's enjoyment of this book is going to be entirely dependent on whether or not you care at all about Scandinavian noir books and Scandinavian mysteries and Scandinavian countries in general, I suppose. Because the first part is just entirely her talking about all of these different mystery series and what these characters are like and how that is or isn't reflective of those cultures. And then the entire second part is her just like traveling to all of those countries. This book also does a really weird thing where once it switches into that second section, it switches from a first person narration to a third person narration, which I don't understand at all. I was so thrown off by it and when I went on Goodreads and a lot of other people were also thrown off by it. I saw someone say on Goodreads that like it possibly was done to make her seem like a character in these books but it feels really weird in my opinion. So she goes from talking about how I read all these books and I picked up all these things to she traveled from country to country or she traveled to this specific town in order to see this house referenced and whatever. And I'm like, why are we doing this? <laughs> yeah, I I'm, I'm, wouldn't say I love this book, but it wasn't a terrible book. Uh, this is the book that I read while I was working the polls. <laughs> and honestly, it was great for that because uh, I didn't love this book. So I wasn't like distracted by this book while I was just supposed to be working. But at the same time, it was very easy for me to like pick up and put down this book because I would just read a couple of paragraphs and put it down to, you know, work the polls. And then I would, there would be a slight lull and I would pick up the book again and be just fine. So yeah, I don't know. If you love Scandinavian noir, then you might really enjoy this book, but I wouldn't say that this was anything groundbreaking or anything like that. And still find the third person thing really weird, but it is really interesting to kind of see from an American perspective, having someone also travel to these Scandinavian countries and talk about what is actually accurate in those books and what's not actually accurate. So from that perspective, kind of interesting. So yeah, like a three star book, nothing amazing, but I wasn't terrible either. All right, next up, I read Minor Feelings, an Asian American Reckoning by Kathy Park Hong. So I originally thought I was going to do an individual review on this book because this was turning out to be like a really great read, but there were like a couple of essays in here that I didn't really love or I didn't really click with, I should say. So this is like part essay collection reflecting on the Asian American experience in the United States and part like memoir essays. And so the first couple of essays I really, really loved the sort of cultural analysis as well as the history provided. Really fantastic. There was one essay in here specifically that really threw me for a loop, which was about like her friendship with these two other I think they were both Korean girls. I don't actually remember if they both were of Korean descent now that I'm talking about it. But yeah, it talks about their friendship and their relationship to art. And like one of them dies by suicide and 
so she talks about like that sort of thing as well and kind of like mental health and expectations and stuff like that so it like kind of makes sense but like so much of it is specifically focused on Kirti Park Hong as an artist and what her life was like in college like trying to be an artist and trying to discover her art and then realizing that she didn't actually want to be an artist and she wanted to be a poet and stuff like that and I was just like I don't know where this essay is going and so I kind of like disconnected a little bit in that essay and I feel like I never really connected back in but I overall I really really enjoyed this book and it brings up a lot of things that I think Asian Americans no, but maybe isn't talked about on a wider scale. It talks about the weird position that Asian Americans are often in because we are both the model minority sort of myth thing. But at the same time, we also face a significant amount of discrimination as well. But again, that discrimination is like relatively not that bad uh, compared to some of the other stuff. But then at the same time, we there's also been like a historical amount of laws and things like that put against Asian Americans from the like straight up exclusion of like Chinese people being able to immigrate into the United States to the internment camps obviously um the way that Asian Americans are pitted against each other but also at the same time the way that they are all grouped into this one big lump sum it's so complicated and I think that this is a very nice introduction into the it's complicated conversation so yeah I really really enjoyed this a lot and I think that it brought up a lot of things that I personally experienced and thought about and felt growing up as someone who is Indian American. So like for that alone, this was basically a four star book. Like if I had only read the first two essays in here, I would have rated this five stars. And I think that also, you know, this is just scratching the surface of what can be said about Asian Americans because it's a, a pretty short book. And obviously there's a lot to encompass that history considering there's so many different cultures and different types of Asian American experiences and she even acknowledges that in here as well. So yeah, this is a really great book in my opinion and I think it's kind of like a good starting point for this conversation of how complicated the conversation of race is in the United States and a lot of us aren't willing to recognize that at all. Like we make it a very, not to like make a joke of it but we make it into a very black or white issue and it is significantly more than that and the final book i have to talk about is dear justice by nick stone this is the follow-up to dear martin that just came out this year i was sent this book by the publishers and this book was kind of disappointing to me i think it's just because like i really really enjoyed dear martin a lot and this book feels like it just falls a little flat compared to that book so this book is basically completely from Quan's perspective. So you definitely should read Dear Martin before you read this book if you haven't already. And so you're seeing what life was like for this one character named Quan who knew Justice from the first book uh, growing up and basically they ended up on two different life paths. And like in the introduction of this book, Nick Stone talks about how after writing Dear Martin, she heard from people who basically said like they would love to see a story told from the perspective of a character like Quan whose life doesn't turn out great like the kids who don't end up being highly educated and going off to ivy leagues and stuff like that like the kids who stay in these neighborhoods and potentially end up going to jail and stuff like that and where who don't always get like those happily ever after sort of endings this perspective again is told from Quan who ends up going to jail and so the story is told partially in these letters that he's writing to justice from jail um, but it's partially just like reflections of events that have occurred over the course of his life so you get to see sort of like how Quan, who is this like very smart black boy ends up in the situation that he's in and how like for a lot of black kids the cards are stacked against them from the very beginning he talks about even in this book like kind of how some of this just feels inevitable like it was inevitable that he was going to end up in this position because of all of the different things that have occurred in his life and it would have been practically impossible for him to have ended up as a success or anything like that so yeah the reason why this book feels kind of disappointing is because it feels kind of expected like they feel like dear martin had like an emotional punch to it there was surprises in it there were things 
that really hit you in the heart. And this one just feels much more surface level. I don't know. It just didn't hit me in the same way. And it might just be me. And again, I don't think that this is a bad book. And I think it's good that this book exists because I think that, again, it's important for kids like that to see their story told. But I don't think it's like the best book. And also, it feels a little bit like they still he still got the happily ever after out of it. I just feel like everything worked out really neatly in this book. And again, it's relatively short and it's young adult. So like maybe I'm expecting too much of it, but it just felt very like surface level to me. So this is like a three star book for me. I know a lot of people are giving it like four or five stars. And I think it's because again, it's good that stories like this are being told. But I don't know if that's necessarily enough to give it a four star, five star rating. So... Controversial opinion, I know. So yeah, let me know down in the comments below if you've read any of the books that I talked about here today um, and what your thoughts were on them or if you have been reading anything particularly interesting this week, feel free to leave that down in the comments section below. I am running through my nonfiction November TBR, which is great. I have two books left on it, so I might try to prioritize those books. If you couldn't tell by like that pile, I'm kind of still mixing in fiction books in between so that way I don't get quote-unquote burnt out and I'm also trying to read down now my physical TBR now that I bought a bunch of books so yeah we'll see what I end up picking up next week I don't have anything significant planned or anything like that other than trying to keep going with my nonfiction November TBR so yeah that's all I have for now and thanks for watching mm -hmm.